Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 210th episode of the CodeCast Podcast. Today, my name is Terry Fletcher. So, as I mentioned before, I am probably... Uh, sitting on a beach somewhere in Hawaii. No, actually, I'm not probably. I am. And so I'm probably sipping a Mai Tai or doing whatever I do just to get a mental break, maybe reading a book, but I'm definitely not working. So um, I did pre-record this before I left, and I think it's an important topic. It's not a top 10 Tuesday, even though it is the last Tuesday of the month, but it is a topic that I started on the uh, Talk 10 uh, Tuesday for um, ICD-10 Monitor. And I wanted to expand on it only because it's an important topic of the TPE audits, and that's the Targeted Probe Educate audits. They started up again on September 1st, and I was only given about four minutes to really discuss them on uh, ICD-10 Monitor. I also have a, an article up there if you want more information on the TPE audits. So make sure you take a look at ICD10monitor.com. But what I wanted to look at today is what CMS announced. So there was a lot of different information out there saying that they would resume at some point, but they didn't give a date. They finally did. And again, what this is, is CMS announced that targeted probe and educate. So TPE audits would resume on September 1st, 2021. So these were suspended during the CMS public health emergency, but just like the recovery audits, uh, they've been reinstated. And so it doesn't seem to matter that there is a public health emergency going on and everyone's pretty tapped and probably completely uh, fatigued on COVID. Their goal is to probably regain some money back that they pushed out. So the TPE TPE audits, uh, make sure you know that acronym is back. And unlike recovery audits, the goal of the TPE is a little different. These are goal, I should say these are targeted to help providers reduce claim denials and appeals with a one-on-one education focused on the documentation and coding of the services that they provide. So who conducts the TPE audits and why do they do them? So your local Medicare carrier, it's not a third party. So the MAC carriers like Noridian, um, Novitas, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arkansas, uh, WPS, all those Medicare MAC carriers, um, they're the ones that actually are in charge of this. And CMS has increased provider education, which results in what they call decreased error rates and appeals through the CMS appeals process. So while originally they limited the scope to these to hospital inpatient admissions and home health claims, because those were the ones that uh, received the most um, claim denials and error rate, but then CMS expanded the program in late 2019 and mostly in 2020 to allow the um, Medicare carriers, the local carriers, to perform TPE audits of all Medicare providers for all items and services billed to Medicare. Now I haven't seen that facilities will be included with except for the limited scope that if they're looking at uh, inpatient hospital admissions and they are included in that total uh, DRG and uh, potential stay. Now why are providers chosen? Okay, basically this is chosen or providers are chosen based on what they call data analysis and, and analytics. They look at high error rate in their billing practices uh, in their submission of claims to MAX or because they're outliers in their code utilization rates compared to your peers. Um, Providers also can be chosen for reason unrelated to their own billing practices. So if you bill for items that have a high error rate nationally, so let's say a 99211, which is a nurse visit, or let's say um, a about patient monitoring code, which those have become all the rage lately. Um, an inpatient hospital stay, I know that the 99223 is a pretty high rated um, error rate code. So things like that, you could be targeted if you uh, bill a high volume of certain codes. 
And also they look at advanced diagnostics. So if you're doing PET scans or nuclear in your office, that could be a red flag as well. Not from a perspective that you're doing them, just from a perspective that they tend to get high error rates. That's why we have the uh, AUC coming out to temper that kind of like the the uh, treatment authorization for those that is coming out in 2022. So what is the TPE audit process? Okay, so provider receives a notice of review letter in the mail, and it's from the MAC carrier, which states the reasons for the that the provider's been selected for the review. And typically you're looking at about 30 records, so that's kind of your key to know if you're getting uh, targeted. But the request can come with about 20 to 40 records that they want you to produce. Once the records are produced, then the MAC will review these 20 to 40 claims against the supporting medical records that you send in um, in a letter detailing the results of their review. Now, please do not ignore these letters. I see so many practices that think it's junk mail. They come in either in a pink envelope or in an envelope that has a window with a pink um, paper inside it. Um, so make sure that you are looking for that. If the claims are found to be compliant and the TPE audit is complete for that provider, so again, physician, hospital, or qualified healthcare uh, professional, and the then the provider cannot be selected again for review for another 12 months for that particular service. So it's not for anything, it just means for the part that you passed where you were found compliant. Now there is a caveat that if the MAC carrier detects significant changes in your billing, so all of a sudden you just start billing for something out of the blue, then they could review you again. Now, if the claims are not found to be compliant, the MAC will schedule that one-to-one -one education for that provider, and they'll schedule, I think it's three to four sessions, and it's specific to the findings, uh, documentation and coding practices. Then the provider has 45 days to make changes, and then you go on to round two. Providers are then given, you typically you're given three rounds to, of the TPE audit to pass. So you don't just fail one time and all of a sudden they say you're tagged for life. You actually, it's, it's supposed to be a learning process. So you get three rounds of TPE audits. So if the, failure, if the provider fails to pass after three rounds, then they will be referred to CMS for further action. And what happens then is not good. That can include 100% prepayment review, meaning that they're not gonna pay you until after they review, so a prospective audit. Um, extrapolation, which means that they'll say, well, your percentages are staying the same of 20% that you failed on, so let's take a look at your entire practice of how many Medicare patients you have times 20% of a particular service, and we're just going to take that completely away, even things they haven't even audited. Or they could refer you to a revenue recovery auditor, so the RAC audits, and now they're looking at anywhere from 100 to 200 records or even other actions. So there, there's, you know, UPIC, CRT audits. There's so many different kinds of audits. So what common mistakes are they looking for? What, are, what has been identified in the TPE audits? So according to CMS.gov, the most common errors identified by CMS are first, the signature of the certifying physician is missing. This could be a manual signature if you're still on paper charts or a missing what they call authentication of the electronic medical record, meaning they closed it out and your physician's uh, first, last name and credentials are in the chart that they basically, it was authenticated and closed out because they said that they agree with everything that's in there and they're authenticating the record, basically taking legal responsibility for it or a missing counter signature for a teaching, a teaching physician claim uh, for an incident to claim if your state requires a counter signature or anything like that, so the supervising physician's uh, signature. The encounter note does not support medical necessity. Okay, so hear what I say here because I'm going to mention this again. The encounter notes do not support medical necessity. So remember, it's the payer's definition of medical necessity for an item or service, not the physician's definition. So it's based on contract information. What do they, you know, look at your local coverage determinations, your national coverage determinations, and what do they say is medically necessary to provide this service? Now the next one is the documentation does not support medical necessity. So the first one said, or the second one said, the encounter notes do not support. The next one says the documentation does not support medical necessity. What does that mean? It means there are missing links from a presenting problem 
and an order test a procedure. So what that means, and that's different from the other one, it means that the patient comes in and they have, let's say they're coming into an orthopedic practice and they're coming in because they have a, a chronically sore ankle. They think they might've twisted or stepped wrong or did or stepped off a step and they didn't know. And they go into their primary care office and they're looking at that, they do an X-ray, but for some reason they also do an EKG. Okay, well there's no link from presenting problem to that EKG when a patient comes in for an ankle fracture or an ankle problem. So see the difference there? The other one basically said that it was the encounter does not support mes medical necessity. So was it a level four? Was it a level three? Um, you know, what did you actually provide for that patient and support it? You know, did you implant a pacemaker and you showed that the patient had sick sinus syndrome? Um, did you uh, do an intervention on the heart and you showed that the patient was having an acute MI? You know, did you do a medial meniscectomy and you showed that the patient actually had a medial tear in the right knee and did you use laterality? That's different than missing links from why they came in and then why you ordered a test. Because some practices have standard tests. They just order for everybody without actually having a presenting problem that warrants it. And then one of the last ones is missing or incomplete certifications or recertification documents. This is a big one because I think um, a lot of practices either forget or get lazy or laxed on this. But what this is, is this is advanced diagnostics. For example, I mentioned the nuclear or CT scans, uh, even x-rays performed in a physician's office. They have certification requirements for safety. And OSHA also has requirements for safety. So if you don't have your recertification documents or incomplete certifications, when they walk in and ask for it, you better have it because um, that could get you into trouble later. So those are the things they're looking for from a targeted probe and educate audit. So let's talk about best practices, okay, for a TPE audit. If you're a provider that has received a request for this audit, the best defense immediately begins prior to sending the requested records. First thing they look for is a complete and organized uh, set of records. And they want that during the first round of the TPE. That gets your chances of passing increased. Okay, if you just send them a bunch of garbage or just a bunch of records, you're, you're definitely moving on to the second round. Healthcare organizations should attempt to prove compliance during the first round and review and avoid another audit for that particular item um, or service for at least another 12 months. So you, you definitely want to not only prove your compliance on what they're requesting, but make sure that during that first round of review, you want to avoid another audit for that same thing for another 12 months. So it's important to show that you've also educated your staff. A well-developed initial response to a TPE audit, that can make all the difference between passing or being referred to CMS for another action. The next steps can include, uh, for erroneous actions, can be that 100% prepay review. Um, it can also possibly be that um, somebody now comes in and takes a look at your practice. The key to avoiding continuous TPE review is improving from round to round. That's what they wanna see. They wanna see a learning curve. So healthcare organizations should strive to increase the accuracy of claims in each round and set goals of improving after each round of TPE review. This can, you're trying to avoid further rounds of review, okay? And improving from round to round, it does require internal review between submissions. You know, internally be proactive. Um, as part of that internal review, your, your organization should document when audits occur and what steps the organization took to address the issues that were part of that TPE audit. Don't just let it go and think, okay, we dodged a bullet. Now you want to make sure that that is well documented, what steps you're doing not only to continue in your efforts to educate and not make the same mistake twice, but then also how are you policing it and checking up on it. Health organizations should also document if they've done training since you were, had the request for the audit. So that is one uh, area that is lacking and that's being proactive for any TPE or Medicare audit and not letting your guard down once the audit is, completing, is completed. And the preparation for an audit should be ongoing. 
You never know when you're going to get a request and you don't want to have to say, oh my gosh, I have to bring in one to two more staff and at your expense to deal with this. It should be just, here's the information ready to go. If you don't have that kind of option or you're a smaller practice, consider engaging either in counsel or a coding and billing consultant. We prep practices all the time, not only for being ready for this, but also making sure that um, they can fight it if they need to. And also it helps because uh, if you decide that you want to challenge the audit, we can put together a defense strategy for you. And this isn't to generate any kind of business for me. I'm busy enough, but this is what we're here for. So if you need that, um, feel free to, to reach out to us. The worst thing you can do is to ignore the request. So one of the top reasons for denial in the later stages of the TPE review is untimely responses. I've seen so many that come to me after they say, hey, by the way, you're in trouble now because you never responded to the request. And responding timely does involve complying with every step of what they call the ADR. That's the additional documentation request. It's important to refer to policies and procedures for the max response to your region. Now here's something, this reminds me of telehealth. The Medicare contract carrier, so the Medicare, um, the MAX, they have a lot of discretion in the TPE audit process. Okay, so when you're looking at them um, as far as what they are able to do or what they, um, what they are targeting, it's they have different policies and procedures for how uh, different healthcare organizations can submit their audit responses. So even though there is a standard TPE audit policy and procedure, it's really it's really up to the MAC carrier and how they want your particular physician, your provider, to actually respond back to them. So I invite you to really look at ICD10Monitor.com, look at my article on that. And if you need help, please contact me directly. Uh, Terry Fletcher CPC at AOL.com. And you can also contact me through my website at terryfletcher.net and go to our contact page. So just wanted to, to bring those things to your attention because I think that now that they are in full swing again, I think this is going to be one of the audits that's going to be out there for a while. Also check out that I am now doing a um, Terry Tuesday audit podcast with Sean Weiss on his The Compliance Guy podcast. I'm telling you guys, I'm everywhere. <laughs> so check that out as well. And uh, hopefully you'll find that insightful and uh, get some information should you run into an audit. There's so many different kinds and we tried to make sure that um, you have information on what it could be, what kind it could be, and how to address that should there ever be a problem. Okay, so let me look at my coding question today. This was a good one. I was like, oh no, oh shoot. <laughs> so this came from one of my family practice clients and it said, can I include the independent interpretation of tests under the category two under data points, the moderate level? If yes, we took an x-ray and charged for it, but as an urgent care, we also send out the x-ray to a radiology group to overread them and we're being charged $12 a patient. We're trying to make sure that we are recouping that uh, that charge, and this is the only way we um, can do that. This should have some reimbursement capture, data point capture. Okay, so the answer is no. On the grid for um, anything that you're seeing through the AMA, it says that you can only charge for, or I should say you can only use the data point for independent interpretation of tests when it is not separately reported. It's right on that AMA grid. And so if it is separately reported and you are billing for it, then you absolutely cannot charge for it. It doesn't matter if you're sending it out to be, have an overread that's for your practice. And that's nice that you do that from an administrative and compliance standpoint, but you have to absorb the cost. So, or it's coming out of your professional component of the global service that you build for on the x-ray. So it's not that you're not getting paid. It's just that you're going to get paid a little less on your professional side um, of your global service because you are sending it out. So no, you cannot capture in data points as well. Our coding question is brought to you today by Metasoft Cloud. Metasoft is a cloud-based medical billing system that is a fast and highly scalable platform that transforms the way healthcare providers manage revenue cycle management. Visit metasoft247.com today for a free trial. So my personal tidbit this week, I mentioned it last week. If you're listening to this podcast right now, picture me on a beach in Hawaii sipping a Mai Tai. That's where I'm at. I promise I'm thinking about all of you. Okay, well, maybe not promise. Just kidding. I'm just happy to be on vacation for the first time in a very long while. 
uh, just me and my husband, no other outside people with us. And uh, it's just a really re nice, relaxing time that I'm happy to be enjoying. So make it a great day, everyone. Talk to you next week on the CodeCast podcast, and we will be well into November. So everyone, again, make it a great day and a great week. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma, music producer Assassin Music. <laughs>